I don't think you can lose and gain uh, and optimize one process or another. Again, no evidence to state that, but just, um, you know, if you want to get bigger and you want to uh, put on lean mass, then in my experience, and again, the, the Bray work that's published in JAMA would back this up, that the easiest diet is the seafood diet. So you see it, you eat it. And so it's sort of functional overeating and you get, you get bigger. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I've ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business. I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and have wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person. Hi guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high-intensity training protocol and your high-intensity training business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. My former guests include people like Dr. Sean Baker, Rob Wolf, Mark Sisson, Dr. Ted Naiman, Dr. Doug McGuff, Noah Kagan, Luke Carlson, Bill De Simone, and many, many more. My next guest is the one and only Dr. Stuart Phillips. Stuart is a professor and director of the Physical Activity Center of Excellence and McMaster Center for Nutrition, Exercise, and Health Research. He is a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair. In essence, Stuart is a badass and probably the top guy most people go to for the latest research on the impact of nutrition and exercise on muscle and muscle protein turnover. You are going to love this episode since we talk about a lot of the stuff you are no doubt very interested in, including the most effective interventions to stop 
and all reverse sarcopenia. We get into a lot of detail regarding resistance training protocols, including including progressive overload versus just going to failure with similar loads, single joint versus multi-joint protocols, his thoughts on conventional high volume training versus high intensity training regarding optimizing muscle hypertrophy and strength. We talk about his thoughts and research on optimal daily protein intake and his thoughts on the zero carb craze. Uh, and should I be concerned, I'm going to get some terrible disease eating all of this red meat. So for all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And don't forget to hang around at the end for your free gift. And without further ado, I give you Dr. Stuart Phillips. Stuart, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Really appreciate having you on my show. It's an honor. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So in preparation for this, I was watching a lot of your presentations on YouTube, a lot of your podcasts, sifting through some of the literature. And I was quite annoyed at myself because I don't know why it's taken me this long to review a lot of your stuff because, you know, I know uh, James Steele really well and James Fisher yeah. and uh, yeah. probably some other of your colleagues. And they all talk about your work all the time. And I just, it's just taken me this long to really get around to consuming it. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's been, I've learned loads, which is great. Um, so I wanted to kind of start off by learning a little bit more about you before we kind of get into some of the, the science. Um, so you, you've spoken before about how you used to be really interested in uh, rugby and ice hockey. And yep. how you used to lift for performance to improve your performance in your sport. And I was yep. curious, I haven't heard you say, you know, why you got into this profession and why you decided to focus on the impact of nutrition and exercise on uh, muscle protein turnover. So was that inspired by these hobbies that you had? Is that how you ended up getting into it or some other? Yeah, innovation? actually, it's, it's an interesting story. It's a true story. Um, I was uh, dead set uh, on going to, to medical school. And uh, in the last year before um, I was due to graduate, I was playing rugby in the summer and I, I broke my leg, uh, actually fractured my kneecap. And so I spent a long time in a cast and I consequently, I couldn't play rugby uh, for my university, which I was planning on doing. And I had, I had time on my hands to do something. So I took up a, a, a thesis in my, my fourth year of university and uh, it kind of flicked a switch for me. It really did change how I looked at research. And um, then I just gravitated towards uh, nutrition, having taken a nutrition class at my fourth year. Uh, I found a supervisor who was doing some work in uh, athletes. And really, it just sort of spun off from there. So it kind of combined uh, a lot of my likes. I, I really liked learning. Uh, I really enjoyed science. I really enjoyed nutrition. And then combining it with the exercise was really uh, the hook for me. Uh, so uh, kind of came at it accidentally, but um, haven't regretted anything uh, uh, since. So, uh, But if you told me when I started, hey, you're going to end up doing this as a career, you're going to do research, you're going to be a professor, I'd have been like, no way. But it just sort of kept going. And I, and I realized how much I enjoyed it. So uh, now it's it, it's hard for me to look back and say that anything went wrong, really, other than not being able to play rugby in my last year. You, know? <laughs> you strike me as being, the, the more and more I learn about you, you strike me as being uh, really obsessed, and I mean that in a, in a complimentary way, uh, in, in like what drives muscle hypertrophy. Um, as as what as being as one aspect and i just wondered like what is it that drives you to want to get you know find more answers around that like what what because i i don't get the feeling like whilst you obviously strength train yourself and i've heard you talk about that you don't strike me as someone who wants to become uh or is obsessed with like competitive bodybuilding or something like that no no i've i've never uh i've never uh body built uh every, anytime i ever lifted weights it was always for the sport that i was playing to be stronger and better in that sport so uh, i have to admit to not having sort of lived the lifestyle if that's the right way to say it um not that i don't understand what bodybuilding is about or or the hypertrophy routines i've seen umpteen sort of different routines i used to train you know uh in my very early days, uh, as sort of a part-time gig, uh, I used to train teams and work with a few bodybuilders, not too many, admittedly, um, but more for sports 
performance than anything else. Um, what really drives me? I, I don't know. I, I guess it's hard to really say other than uh, I, I never get tired of learning. Uh, I'm surrounded by a, a terrific group of uh, research fellows and PhD and master's students and then a, a huge undergraduate population whose thirst for knowledge uh, just sort of, you know, keeps pushing me as well. So they keep asking good questions. Uh, other friends and colleagues ask good questions. And I, I think that was probably my entry into all of this was uh, – I never got tired of, of learning and I, and I never have. So, and, you know, if I sort of say anything to my students, it's try and be a lifelong learner and never close your mind to one thing or another and always be open to uh, different ways of looking at things and different opinions. So it's, I guess it is an obsession. Um, I, I do have obsessive uh, <laughs> traits and tendencies, probably like a lot of people. Um, but it's, I, I see it as a productive one and it's a uh, intellectual very stimulating. So keeps me going. Cool. And I guess, yeah, one last question on, um, I guess in terms of like, you know, what's, what's, uh, you know, what drives you to, to research this area and to go as deep as you have and to continue to be passionate about it. Um, how do your findings, um, you know, you obviously you guys have made a bunch of discovery discoveries in terms of like, you know, protein intake and ways to achieve uh, muscle hypertrophy and stuff like that. How are they applied in the real world? Yeah, you know, that's that's a good question, because honestly, um, I, I don't spend a lot of time uh, talking to people who are the appliers of what we do. So the the people at the full face, uh, excuse me, the cool face, the the strength and conditioning trainers. Uh, and, and it's not that I, uh, you know, I don't get invited to their conferences. I do. Uh, and I'm always happy to chat with them. But my day to day routine is, you know, it's more spent wrapped up closer to the lab, even though my primary lab is, uh, well, it's a gym. Um, but the wet lab where we've taken, you know, blood samples and muscle biopsies and that sort of thing is uh, that's what drives a lot more of my my time. Um, rather than the application, so I'd be I, I'd freely admit that, but I'm I'm not completely out of touch with you know the latest sort of uh, dogma and theories and what people think makes men and women stronger, faster, etc. So how it gets applied, honestly, my hope is that um, to some degree my presence on social media. Um, my talks and things like this podcast are mm. are able to trickle down, if you like, to the uh, the people who are able to use the information. Um, but uh, I'd be honest again in saying that there are a lot of ways to you know get people fit and get people strong. So uh, we're only part of the uh, the repertoire. Um, but you know maybe we have challenged a few I think notions that a lot of people held pretty dear. Oh, re- rest but, assured the the you know your impact is huge <laughs> if you think oh, about well, I'm, I'm glad to hear, i'm always glad to hear that <laughs> <laughs> if you think about all the people that will take you know your some of your findings and then you know incorporate that into their training protocol um to get a more efficient workout and to improve their health i think that's that's awesome um okay so i want to just touch on sarcopenia for a second um i heard you speak about this on another podcast obviously we know that resistance training can slow or reverse sarcopenia to an extent i just wondered what in your opinion what are the most effective interventions to slow sarcopenia um i guess in terms of exercise and nutrition or other yeah so i'm it's a it's a massive topic and and, and i don't think it's i you know to me it really represents probably uh, the five-year plan for what we're doing here uh, in terms of our research and everything else, mainly driven by demographics and maybe driven by my own aging as well. But <laughs> um, the, the proportion of, popu- of the world's population that is going to be over 65 is going to be staggering in the next, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in the UK, anywhere in the EU, uh, North America, uh, Asia, it, it's just, it's everywhere. So population aging is a huge issue. And declines in mobility um, are, are, are going to be a big deal. You know, the more people that are made to be immobile and disabled, uh, the more health problems we're going to have. So sarcopenia, it's a huge issue. And I think it's, it's probably fair to say that there's been, to date, no other intervention that is as effective as resistance exercise. 
Now, you can talk about things like testosterone replacement, and I wouldn't say it's ineffective, um, but it really has a poor side effect profile for women. Um, and I'm not sure that it's considered 100% safe, even for men. Now, on measured titrated doses, people might disagree with that. But Why, why is that? Sorry? Why, why would it be potentially unsafe? I think the, the, the biggest risk with testosterone is probably related to, um, I, I mean, most reproductive tissue cancers and prostate cancer being the chief amongst them, that is the biggest risk for uh, mortality in men at, over the age of 40, um, is that, you know, there's a reason why testosterone declines biologically, I think, and obviously uh, augmenting it artificially would, I think, uh, increase your risk for uh, prostate cancer. Now, again, a lot of people would, would disagree, but um, I think the long-term data on that is probably uh, not yet available, I would say. So we're, we're going to find out because there's a generation of men who have been on um, testosterone, low-dose testosterone, and you know we're, we're going to see what happens. Cardiovascular disease is another uh, aspect. But I, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about non-pharmacological uh, intervention, then there's no doubt that resistance exercise, and we've advocated for a long time in, in combination with higher than recommended protein intakes and probably well-timed, high-quality protein, all the things that the bodybuilders have, you know, figured out are uh, the most effective ways to offset muscle loss. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you some questions about, sorry, were you going to say something else then? No, I'm, I'm not good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm certainly going to ask you some questions about protein intake. Um, now, Going on to resistance training, um, got a bunch of questions. I'm really been really looking forward to ask you. Um, when when people come to you and say, "Okay, okay, Stuart, I uh, you know I want to uh, undertake some kind of exercise regime," what what do you recommend to them in terms of like a protocol? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it's interesting. Uh, my tune on that has changed over the years, and I and I'm very fond of um, telling, particularly younger men who ask that question. I said there are two types of people: there are guys who uh, or girls who talk about lifting weights, and then there are people that do it. <laughs> uh, so I say that number one variable that that is more important than anything else, sets, reps, and everything else, is getting to the gym. So I think that's where, you know, the participation statistics on resistance exercise in North America by self-report, so I think it's an over-exaggeration, is that about <laughs> somewhere around 8 to 9% of the population wow. regularly engages in resistance exercise. So that's horrific in my estimation, given the health benefits and everything else that it's in, uh, in view. So I say to people that the program that's best is the one that gets you coming back to the gym. Now, Sex reps and et cetera, how do these things progress? Um, I have to be honest that uh, I don't talk about those variables much anymore. I start with something basic, and it would probably be, you know, if you follow uh, the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, uh, one to two sets, probably around 60% one RM, get over the soreness, and then progress from there. But honestly, I think that the the multitude of variables that are tweaked uh, in terms of drop sets and these sorts of things become relevant only for the people that are at the really high end of the food chain and really drive themselves for the for the masses for the mere mortals i think that it has much more to do about just getting to the gym so i answer that question a lot differently now uh, than i did you know 20 years ago when i first started at mcmaster and and i uh I'm a little bit unapologetic about that because I know it pisses a lot of people off. But frankly, uh, if you don't go to the gym, then nothing happens. So um, <laughs> sets, reps, splits, blah, 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 you know, just get in the gym and uh, train with purpose. So it, and then find somebody if you don't have the routine that knows what you're talking about. And you can get like all kinds of things work to make it bigger and stronger. Mm. There's not uh, I'm. I, I'm, I'm really um, not. The, what's, what's the right word? I'm underwhelmed by a lot of this science of this routine is better than that routine. I, I just don't find it overly compelling because there's so many variables that you can change that no one routine can be so superior to another that it would force me to say this is what you must do. 
Yeah. Um, just on that then, I mean, what variable do you think is the most important when trying to optimize one's results in terms of, I guess, muscle hypertrophy? You know, some people think it's just get to failure is pretty much the only variable that matters. What, what do you think? Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I use the word failure. I, I don't like to use the term. Uh, I say fatigue because failure has all kinds of negative implications. But I mean, the, the, the main point is probably, and, you know, people have attempted to look at programs and say, what's most important? Probably you need to be in the gym, a minimum, I would say, of two times a week. Three may be better. I think after that, the returns begin to diminish. Doesn't mean that it, like, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm in the gym five days a week. So uh, in my youth, I was in the gym six, seven days a week. But, all right. So once or twice a week, at least. And then I think it probably has as much to do with working to, I like to use effort and say an, uh, an eight to or a nine out of 10 uh, on an effort scale, which probably means you get very close to failure, but taking that one last rep left in the tank um, or two that you would have to get spotted. And I'm, I'm not sure for most mere mortals that really matters. And then after that, it's it's probably a little bit of volume. Um, I think you can mix in all kinds of repetition ranges uh, and get similar benefits unless you're interested in absolute maximal strength. And then you've got to lift very, very heavy things. And I mean, the, the power lifters have figured that out long ago. That's really interesting. And that, that brings me on to, you know, if we're just talking about increasing muscle mass, um, there's this kind of notion in resistance training called progressive overload. Um, mm. And I wonder, do you feel, I, I've you know, spoken to some of my guests I've had in the past, don't feel that's necessary to optimize uh, muscle hypertrophy. Do you actually feel that it is? Or do you think it doesn't matter? And if one just trains like you just described in terms of the the level of effort then you're going to get there i think the biggest variable in determining uh hypertrophy is uh you know picking your mom and dad wisely <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you really do in the end i think uh, a large part and i mean a very large part of the response is driven uh, by your genetics and so that's the the foundation and probably uh, i think a very large part of the response the science to show that is it's lacking um, we hope to be able to contribute uh, substantially in the in that area in the next maybe year or two um, to to uh, reinforce that notion. But I honestly uh, I think you can get uh, hypertrophy in a lot of different ways, as we've shown: uh, low loads, high loads, mm -hmm. uh, lower volume. Uh, I think that there probably is some variable in there that's important. Uh, for different people, it may be something different. I think diet plays a factor in there. Uh, but I think that they're minor contributors by comparison to um, what you have as a genetic blueprint. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I know I'm really splitting hairs now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this, um, this debate about uh, I, I don't know if it's still an ongoing debate or whether you've, you've published anything recently on this, um, but about uh, direct work versus like compound work on muscles. Um, yeah. I, I listened to an interview you did, I think it was with Brett Contreras, and it's pr yeah. like four years ago or three years ago now, so I could be completely out of date with this. Um, yeah. And he, he his view was that, you know, direct work, or certainly was back then, um, direct work was optimal for – you know, muscle growth and that, you know, if, if one wants to optimize one's appearance that you can't just rely on a, a routine with just big movements. However, uh, I know Paolo Gentile's group did a study comparing the two. So comparing multi-joint and single joint and showed no difference. However, right. <laughs> it was a really small group. It was 29 men and they were all untrained. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that applies to a large group and, and, and obviously people that are advanced. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, look, um, I, I I think that it's uh, it's great. I mean, people are doing some great science in this area and trying to answer the questions, which I think is terrific. And and, and I do I agree um, around uh, Paolo's findings and you know the attempt to answer the question and then you you know people say oh it's untrained subjects you know those are just new games and, 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 you know, and I, I I have to chuckle a little bit because I have to find out what new games were when I I first term. <laughs> Brett works with some, you know, very high-end uh, bodybuilders and figure models and uh, figure competitors 
Um, and I, I think I'd be fair in saying, and I don't want to misquote Brett, but I, I was at a conference um, uh, much earlier this year with Brett and listened to him. And we talked about some of the routines, particularly that he put some of his female um, clients through. And they vary tremendously. I, I, I don't know that he would agree 100%. I mean, I think he has a general philosophy, but I'm not so sure that he would subscribe as, as, as hard um, you know, to one or the other now as he would have previously. I think he sort of maybe agrees with me and, you know, we agree to disagree on some things that, uh, to a large part, it's, um, you know, it's some sort of inherited capacity. And then after that, some people can uh, withstand a lot of volume and they can train five or six days a week. Other people just seem to be able to not to be able to tolerate that. And I'm not saying that that's a genetic characteristic. It could be something, you know, mental or psychological or neurological. Mm. Um, but certainly, uh, I don't know that he'd be as hard and fast on that. And, you know, um, march on science. I mean, I hope that we could answer the question in an evidence-based fashion. But I do think that strength and conditioning is an area that is... Um, dominated to a large degree by people's uh, experiences and anecdotes and you can you can begin to believe one scheme or another based on one or two responsive athletes and forget about you know several other athletes that you've kind of left by the wayside because they were like oh, i just can't handle this and you're like oh well too bad you know it's sort of like the the east german uh high block periodized sessions that would kill some people but you know the east germans had a slew of really great uh lifters in that time and probably helped by a lot of other things agreed um <laughs> but they just had to keep it standing and you pass the other ones aside and then all of a sudden this becomes a good train but it's good to train because that's the only way and that brings the- sorry Stuart, you cut out there for that that last sort of 10 seconds well i i said i i think that the the anecdote of success really dictates to a large degree what some people view as the way to do things and the people that aren't able to tolerate or don't respond whatever that is are sort of forgotten and it's just this works for some people because it allows some people to express uh, their best and become their best but it doesn't work for everybody so i uh you know again uh, not to dismiss a lot of science is being done, um, but I, I, I think people need to be very careful when they say this is the best way. It's a way, but maybe not the best. Yeah, like it's it's because we're kind of talking about selection bias a bit here, aren't we? Um, so, you know, I, I live in Ireland and I've joined the the gym here and like – I don't know whether just Irish men just tend to be bigger than English men. Um, but like, I am easily the skinniest guy in this gym, you know? Um, and, and it's, it's, un, it's unreal. Like every guy in there is just jacked <laughs> and they right. might, they might be on stuff. I don't know, but, um, it, it's so, it's so, uh, prevalent in this gym that it, it almost makes me forget about things like selection bias i start thinking oh what are they doing and then i'm like no no no, this is definitely a selection bias going on here because um it's just nuts though i've never seen anything like it even when i was living in england uh, and i train at gyms there i didn't it, you know i wouldn't be you know the smallest guy in the gym so no it's it's, it's interesting and i think there's so many people fall for that don't they um, yeah, listen, look, I, I mean, if, if you are ever in uh, the United States and, and you want to, you know, so you spend a lot of time in gyms and it's not surprising that all of a sudden you find yourself sitting next to somebody in a gym who is, I mean, there's always going to be somebody that's bigger. But um, when you go to some of these NFL combines, for example, uh, even with college age players, so I think people look at co- uh, U.S. college football and they say, look at those men. And I say, you know, a lot of those men in quotation marks are 18, 19, 20 years old. They're very young. Um, and yet they are astonishingly big and astonishingly strong. And, you know, a lot of them are African American by descent. And we know, uh, data will tell us it's not a racial comment, but there is a propensity in African American males to have genetic polymorphisms, which allow them to 
have greater muscle mass or at least have a propensity to have greater muscle mass than you see hulking, and I mean hulking human beings, not all of them African-American, admittedly, but these guys are monsters. And you all of a sudden you realize, they say, what routine is this? And I can take you from the university on the West Coast to one university on the East Coast, doing totally different things, but they all have monstrous men playing across particularly the offensive line. I mean, we're talking about, you know, on average, uh, about 140, 150 kilos. That's impressive. Wow. That is a 20-year-old or 21 year I mean, I don't know what these people do for the rest of their life, but they are big human beings. Oh, that's, that's really that's interesting. interesting. Um, so, again, like I, I, I know, again, we're, we're sort of splitting hairs, but I'm just really – there's a couple of questions I wanted to ask within this category. Um, my feeling is, based on, I guess, my experience and what I've read and listened to today, is that I don't think – there's much difference between working out, you know, in a conventional style. So working out with multiple sets and multiple times per week versus doing a high intensity training routine. So single sets of failure, let's say two or three times a week. Um, and I know that, I know that, the, that uh, Brad's group um, published a meta analysis of single set versus multiple set. But I also know that James and both the Jameses over in the UK published a, a, a or, or fingers James Fisher uh, published the the meta uh, beware of the meta analyses and then uh, highlighted the crisis of replication and and so I I just I just don't feel like there's much difference and with there being you know potentially no different or little or no difference with if high intensity training being that much more efficient I feel like that's the the more kind of efficacious path. What, what do you think about that? Is my cognitive bias really coming into play here? Or is... So I, I'd be honest, and, and you know, we chatted a little bit about this before uh, we started officially chatting here. Is that so? I have a I have a very good friend and colleague here at McMaster University named uh, Martin Gabala, who uh, oh, yeah. has really, really done some terrific work on uh, high intensity training, uh, you know, aerobic style. So. Um, and as he points out, and quite correctly, uh, the number one cited reason why people don't work out is a lack of time. And it's it's almost universal, like you can take it across a lot of countries, um, probably doesn't transcend socioeconomic status too much, but oftentimes it does. People say, I just don't have time. So time efficiency, if that's truly an excuse, then is a very important variable to consider. And a lot of people have sort of, you know, poo-pooed or dismissed our Low intensity work saying it takes longer. And I said, you know, I always say, don't get me wrong. We never did publish that stuff to say, you know, you should definitely do this all the time and never do anything else. That's not the point. The point was to say it and a lot of other things work. But coming back to your, your time crunch um, question, I think it's important. I'll, I'll state for the record that I agree. And I think that it's important to tease out the nuanced details of meta-analyses that show significant differences on a standardized mean difference that when you actually figure out how much they're worth, it might mean that doing the three sets versus the one, while it's significant, it took 30 different studies with over uh, 900 or 1,000 individuals to find a significant, statistically significant difference. But what it meant in reality was that you gained an extra half a kilo or that you got an extra 10 kilos. Now, if you want the half kilo and you want the 10 kilos in strength and you're, you know, playing in, uh, you know, premiership rugby or NHL ice hockey or, mm. you know, you're hoping to stand on the podium uh, in Tokyo, don't get me wrong, go for it. There's, there's no reason for you not to. But if you are one of the, you know, the unwashed masses and have me mediocre physiology like me, I look at it like this. If you dip a cloth in water and you begin to wring it out, the first time, the first few times you twist, you get a lot of water out. And I think that's one set. As you twist harder and harder, less water comes out. I think that's sort of up to two and three sets. And then you twist more and more and more, a little bit more water comes out. But man, it's hard work. And so if you've got time, to do five or six sessions and five or six sets and et cetera, et cetera, power to you. But I think for the time press person, you get a lot of water out of the rag just doing the one set 
and high intensity work to failure. The same is true with the, uh, you know, with the hit training on the bike. So, you know, the short answer to the question is I agree with you. And I think the analogy uh, is fitting in this situation. It's one that most people tend to go, but yeah, but, and I'm like, look, if you want to do that, go for it. But if you're time pressed, I, I a hundred percent agree. No, that's, that's really interesting. So I guess, you know, time efficiency aside, do you feel like, do you, do you feel like there's any, um, do you feel like, you know, that type of high intensity definition that I gave, which is really important to define our terms, um, is, is suboptimal though, if you're really looking for that kind of last, you know, five or 10% of overall gains, do you feel like, I guess, Brad's approach and the, the kind of higher, higher volume approach, um, maybe more or high frequency approach, maybe more, um, efficacious than that in, in the interest in the, you know, in the pursuit of, I guess that last five or 10%. Yeah. It, it, I think it's hard, uh, to, to say, you know, uh, unequivocally that that's true. And that's the case. The, uh, you know, uh, uh, both of the, the, the James's, uh, you mentioned opinions on meta-analyses. I mean, meta-analyses are as good as the the studies that go into them, not all studies are done um, as, as beautifully as others. So, um, but, you know, I'm from McMaster University and I'm forced to uh, admit that I accept meta-analytic findings as evidence-based. Uh, otherwise, I, I lose my, my card-carrying McMaster status. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to say, you know, with a great degree of certainty, is there, is it better? Maybe. Yeah. You squeeze a little bit more out, but you know, unless you're at the very top, I'm not sure that it's a hundred percent necessary. And I, I, I would probably say that a lot of guys at the top, particularly as they get a little bit older in the sport, begin to figure out because their recovery times get a bit longer that they can get away with doing less and still maintain, maybe even improve some of their strength and body composition and not do anywhere near the volume or the frequency that they did when they were younger. So uh, I, I can't, yeah, and that's completely anecdotal. So you know, <laughs> put, put on uh, as much weight on, on what I just said as you want. But I you know some people, great. If you can handle it, do it. If you've got the time, go for it. Is it necessary? I, I'm not 100% convinced. Cool. Uh, and just for the record, I, I think when I first started doing this podcast, I, you know, I've, and I've been, this has been pointed out to me a couple of times in the past, I, I became a bit too dogmatic about high intensity training as an approach to exercise, especially when you're talking about what you were just talking about in terms of um, compliance um, and other, you know, public health and other things like that. And I kind of went into my interview with Brad with that kind of dog dogma and, you know, I had that bias. And I guess the more, the more I read his work, the more I do actually respect what he's saying, especially I think some of his latest literature regarding frequency of training. Um, so I just wanted to say for the record, I don't want people to think that I, I don't respect Brad and what he's done. I do. And in fact, I, you know, I follow him quite closely now. Um, yeah, well, you no, know, Brad and I have, you know, we've collaborated on some stuff recently on a protein meta analysis. I got a ton of respect for the guy. He, he, he's a great, uh, scientist. He, he does good work. And so I, I, I agree with you. And I think the answer is, is much harder to, uh, to tease out and just saying, well, this meta analysis. And, and once again, I could, you know, Anecdotally, you can find people that defy that. And when you look through some of these meta analyses, one of the things I teach my students to look at is when you get those uh, stem and leaf plots. I said, how many studies line up on either side of the, you know, favors the intervention or favor or doesn't favor the intervention that didn't find statistical significance? Because they might have been close, which probably means they're small and underpowered. But if it means that you need it, as I said, you know, 30, 40 studies with over a thousand subjects to show that something's significant, then physiologically, what you have to ask is, is it truly relevant? And if you are a premier athlete, then maybe it is. But if you're the mere mortal, uh, then maybe not. Yeah, I'm standing here nodding enthusiastically, but I'm, I'm trying not to make no <laughs> I'm trying not to make noises whilst you uh, speak because there's a bit of feedback in the audio. So just know that oh, okay. I am I am I'm very enthusiastic about your answers, <laughs> even if you can't hear me. Um, 
so I want to come on to, to protein intake for a moment. Um, I've heard you, don't know whether you still recommend this, but the, the, the recommendation I heard you talk about before was a uh, one point uh, one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight, um, for protein intake, um, which is, which is obviously higher than the uh, recommended daily allowance. Do you still believe, is that still your recommendation for protein intake? I, I, yeah, I, I definitely stick with about 1.2 now, particularly for older people. I think that's the minimum. Uh, I, I think 0.8 is uh, the wrong target. And there's actually, I mean, there's very good science behind that now. Um, I think that based on our recent meta-analysis, that 1.6 or twice the RDA uh, is the protein intake for younger guys when you're looking at, uh, and admittedly, there's very few studies on women, so we need to do some more work in that area. But I'm, I'm, I'm forced to really conclude that I find it hard to believe that you know, being the same species in a different sex and sex hormones you know, aside, that uh, the protein requirements would be different. So 1.6 grams per kilo per day is sort of the, the spot beyond which I think you begin to get diminishing returns. Uh, Brad and Alan, who are both uh, Alan Aragon, who are co-authors on our meta-analysis, uh, tend to push the, the upper limit of the confidence interval that we had on that um, in that one paper to, to about 2.2. And, you know, if I wanted to say, um, quote, unquote, upper limit, then 2.2 would probably be it. But I think it's, again, it's sort of like 1.6 is, well, that's like doing the one set and 2.2 is like doing the three sets. You know, you've got a lot of water out of the cloth at 1.6. And I don't know that the returns in terms of muscle mass and lean mass gain when you go to 2.2 are uh, as great, at least as most as most people perceive and definitely not as big as a lot of supplement companies would have you believe. Interesting. Um, so... When you, you've, you've, um, you kind of alluded to there and you've mentioned in the past that you think there may be, well, you know, benefits in obviously exceeding 1.2, you mentioned 1.6. I, I just wondered what, what might be the benefits in exceeding this dose? Uh, and how does that work? Like what might be the mechanisms there? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that, uh, you only have to look as far as, uh, uh, Joey Antonio's work where he's, you know, had people on very high intakes, three and four grams per kilo. I, I mean, I've seen a bit higher, particularly wow. in smaller female figure competitors when they cut. And I, and I think that the main point, and, you know, he constantly, when I post something on social media, he said, well, our study, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I get it. I get it. Uh, but the point is in, 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 his studies, there's no benefit to those higher intakes in terms of gaining lean mass. What he does see is a reduction in body fat. And there, what I think you might be seeing is the satiety effect of protein. I mean, I don't know that there's much doubt and, you know, I'm not a satiety expert, but protein is one of the most satiating macronutrients. So um, you, you just, uh, you, you reduce your calorie intake spontaneously because you, you just feel full. You know, you don't have a lot of appetite, desire, drive to eat. And, um, it's also probably true that protein as a substrate is biochemically. And, you know, uh, I don't care what anybody says. You can show me the metabolic pathways, but it is very difficult to turn into fat. So over quote, over consumption of, of protein does not lead to fat gain. It's just, it's ridiculously hard to do. And even in situations of overfeeding, you know, George Bray's work would show that what you do is you begin to lay down a little bit more muscle, but it's, um, it's, you know, as a macronutrient, it's both satiating and it does build muscle. Um, and you know, at some point, a lot of these athletes just, you know, you got to shovel some fuel into the machine. So, uh, the, the figure competitors and the bodybuilders, um, their, their diet becomes built around protein until they might want to just, you know, fill out on some carbs and going into the competition phase. But, uh, that's sort of my take on that. If there's any advantage to it, but it's definitely not muscle building. I don't think beyond, I mean, 2.2 would at least be the upper limit. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting. I, I would completely attest to what you're saying. And I wondered as well, is there also, you know, the more, if you're eating high protein, there's a fermic cost as well, like a calorie burning effect there too. Is that yep. fair to say? Yep. Yep. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, 
reason number three on the list. Um, I'm not so sure it plays as big a role because I think that thermic effect is diminished the longer you're on the uh, higher protein diet. Um, I don't have any I don't have any data to support that, but uh, just sort of a, a guess on what happens to some of the biochemistry. But I I do think that uh, that's yeah. I mean, it's calories in and then calories out, right? So you're burning a little bit more uh, in terms of you know being able to assimilate that food. So, yep, it, it, it all, you know, every little bit begins to add up. So, um, yep. Hmm. So I've been um, experimenting with some quite controversial diet recently. Um, <laughs> I had a, I had a Dr. Sean Baker on the podcast. Who's, oh, yeah. Great. Oh, you're, you're familiar. Oh, okay. I am. Um, so obviously he's been uh, zero carb for the last, I think, eight or nine months, uh, yes. literally eating, you know, huge portions of red meat once or twice yes. a day. Yes. Um, yes. And I've, I've since moving to Ireland, um, I, I actually ate twice a day uh, when I first moved here because I was living with my girlfriend's mum and she wouldn't let me cook. So to, to be more convenient, I just kind of settled with, you know, she would cook two meals a day and we would have two meals a day and that's it. Um, right. And I then carried on doing that. I, I was looking at my body composition. I was like, oh, this is, you know, I'm eating, sometimes eating crap in these two meals, but my, you know, my body composition is, it seems to be improving. Uh, and obviously you could, uh, you know, just say that's down to the calories. Um, but anyway, since moving and then uh, kind of setting up my own place here, I've basically embraced kind of Sean's, Sean and kind of Ted Naiman as well as another. Um, of just eating two large meals. So doing kind of intermittent fasting and then eating a large kind of lunch, uh, which is sometimes, you know, two steaks or a steak and a small omelette. Um, and then in the evening, a, another steak and then normally a potato or vegetables. And that's what I've basically been doing for kind of four months. And I've, you know, my, my body composition is the best it's probably ever been as a result of that. Um, which is fascinating to me. And I just wondered, you know, do you think there's any downsides to eating in that fashion? Cause I know that you've spoken before about how greater meal frequencies might be important from a protein intake point of view. Yeah. So, uh, to be clear on the greater meal frequencies, we talk about that, uh, with athletes who are trying to optimize body composition. So we talk about trying to hit the system with protein to build muscle mass. Now, um, you know, losing fat is a different situation. Uh, I think you can do both at the same time. Uh, we've shown that and a lot of other groups have. Some people don't believe it's possible and some people still write blog posts saying it's not possible, but if they just haven't read science, I don't think. Um, but it's not optimal for either. I don't think you can lose and gain uh, and optimize one process or another. Again, no evidence to state that, but just, um, you know, if you want to get bigger and you want to, uh, put on lean mass, then in my experience, and again, the, the Bray work that's published in JAMA would back this up, that the easiest diet is the seafood diet. So you see it, you eat it. And so it's sort of functional overeating and you get, you get bigger. A lot of guys who haven't been gainers begin to be gainers. Um, but they get fatter too. Um, the diet that you're following, I, I think for altering body composition, I mean, obviously it works for you. Uh, I think Sean and, and Ed both attest, at least based, you know, on uh, social media conversations, and that's being 140 characters at a time and <laughs> all of those situations. So I, I can't really say too much, but I, I'm, you know, uh, I know of enough people who do eat like that and, you know, swear by it in terms of satiety and body comp. And, and, and it begins to, uh, to, you know, to become difficult to rebut. I mean, I think the pundits would probably say is that you may be increasing your risk for a colorectal cancer, but I think the bad evidence is probably a little bit flimsy. I'm not worried about protein intake and your bones dissolving or your kidneys failing. And you know, if you haven't heard me rant about that, I, I just don't think it's a big deal. Um, and as long as you're active, I think that uh, a lot of the risks uh, around that eating style, if there are you know, true risks, are completely mitigated. So, you know, power to you if you uh, you can a uh, stick to that, and I think that's a big part of any sort of dietary regime where you're changing body composition. And uh, you know, uh, your genetics are they allow you to uh, exist on it, and you know, you're good to go. 
I mean, meat is, and proteins tend to be the ones that you're describing those sources, very nutrient rich sources of, um, you know, high quality proteins. So they've got lots of other things that, you know, our diets, actually a lot of other people are lacking in when they choose not to eat meat, for example, or are harder to get when they choose not to eat meat. I just probably upset a lot of vegetarian people, but if you understand what I'm saying. No, that's awesome. And I know you've got a you've got a rush off, Stuart. You've got an important meeting with the dean. So yeah, I, will not, I will not keep you, but uh, I feel like this is this has been like five minutes. It's just gone so quickly. Uh, but I've really enjoyed your time. And um hopefully in the future we can have a we can have a part two. Um sure. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah. Awesome. I mean the, the sign is when time flies is you're you're having fun, right? That's how the saying goes. But I think that's the best part. Uh, and it sort of epitomizes, you know, when you asked about me getting into science, I, I can sit and talk this stuff with somebody all day long. I, I don't get a lot of times to do that. Uh, I do like to do it at meetings. Uh, I'm very enthusiastic about, and, and I think I, you know, if there's anybody out there listening who kind of goes, oh, there's Stu Phillips. I don't want to talk to Stu Phillips. I'm, I'm a completely regular person. You know, I like to go to the gym like to have a few beers you know i like steak dinners too but i'm very approachable so <laughs> don't be afraid to come and talk to me if you see me at a conference or something i know a lot of people say can i send you email i'm like no don't send me an email because i get about 800 of those a day so. <laughs> i must say i was like, it's always a pleasure man i was looking at your profile and i was thinking oh you know i, you know, I always feel quite intimidated at first and then i watched a load of your interviews and i was like this guy's really funny like this is going to be fine you know no, man, i'm, I'm completely regular i'm yeah I'm, I'm probably a complete nerd too but uh you know i'm, I'm kind of a funny nerd i guess i don't know so, so what's the best way for people to uh find out more about you and what you're up to uh uh, uh twitter uh, i got a handle on twitter uh mac kim prof m-a-c-k-i-n-p-r-o-f uh and i'm on facebook as well Stuart phillips uh i'm the Stuart phillips associated with mcmaster not the famous hairdresser uh in london <laughs> He, uh, like this guy is shockingly famous, and some people are, yeah. you, you do hairdressing, hairstyling too. I said, no, no, that's my alter ego. But um, yeah, so you can follow me on uh, on Twitter or find me on Facebook. Uh, generally, I you know I, I hop on and hop off depending on you know what else is going on in my life. But I, I try and spend a few minutes a day kind of you know, pop in and out of some compost. Awesome. Um, so to everyone listening, to find the show notes and links and resources, everything that you know, both Stuart and I have mentioned in terms of studies and things like that, um, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And on there, you'll see all of the episodes. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corp warrior.com that's c-o-r-p warrior.com and enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you will be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts this episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized 
utilized by many high intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right, guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So, again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference, the science and application of strength training for health and human performance. Would you like to learn from the top strength training researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, join a welcome reception on a Friday night to build relationships with other strength training professionals, experience an early morning workout from an expert trainer to kickstart your Saturday, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do, and that is why I am attending and interviewing all of the speakers at the event. The Resistance Exercise Conference will be held on the 9th and 10th of March 2018 in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Commons Hotel. To get 10% off your entry fee, head on over to resistanceexerciseconference.com, click the registration button, and enter Corporate Warrior 10 in the promo code field in PayPal. I'm very excited about this and I've wanted to attend for years. Sign up now at resistanceexerciseconference.com and get 10% off with promo code CORPORATEWARRIOR10 and I look forward to meeting you in person.